Okay, so that's the title of my presentation of this lecture. And uh, I put it very general because that was a summer school. So we show you data and algorithms that we develop and are all published already. So, and I can share this presentation in full later on. So, uh, I'm not sure which level you guys are. I know that some are from medical background, some more computer science. So I will do an introduction of complex system and network science. So who knows is a network, scale-free network? You ever heard about it? This kind of thing? Okay. The network statistic, like the power law, the small world, and so forth. That's are important, this introduction, because the methods that we develop to study, for example, GWAST, are based on topological property of the network. So for you to understand what is a coef the degree coefficient and so forth, cluster coefficient, it's important to understand the technique. So then I, I've introduced several computational tools developed by us to study different systems, not only uh, human-related systems, and the application of this, in particular, genetic interaction network in human and East, and population genetic data set, like human migration out of Africa. <coughs> that is important also for GUI study, for several reasons. So, like I said, all these are published, so uh, I shared this one, so if you want to see in details the technique or use the technique, you can look this paper here. So, my lab is a very multidisciplinary lab. That's a people in my lab, it's called Integrative System Biology. So there are people from all over the world and also people from all of different disciplines. So we are physicists, computer scientists, we have also marine biologists, uh, because we do some study on uh, fishes too. So we need to understand what is the physiology of the fishes. Uh, because the type of analysis that I will introduce you now, you can understand, and also, as we saw from my colleague before, uh, it requires multiple interests and multiple uh, background, right? To generate the data, for instance, to analyze the data, to interpret the data, and so forth. So these people, they all work together, but they're all from uh, different background. And the work I told today is mostly by Gregorio, that was a PhD student of mine, now graduated. So, what is a complex system? So, um, well, a complex system is a system is named complex when it's formed by heterogeneous component, so different type of component, that when they come together, let's say they interact, <coughs> uh, they generate the property that are not visible when you study the single component. So that's our called emergent property. Like when the flow of the bird, they fly like this, or the music, the symphony coming out from music from different instruments, or of course the human body. So what are these emergent properties? Are robustness. So complex system that the human body is robust. If you think about this mutation, we our DNA get mutated every time a lot when the cell divides, but we don't get disease all the time. Right? We don't die every time we divide, for instance. So they are robust. They are susceptible to attack. If you think about it, the HIV. So like why the HIV is so successful? Because in fact the cell tests are developed for protect us against virus. So if an uh, intelligent being know which are those cells, it's the most obvious thing to do. Another example is the computer, the World Wide Web. World Wide Web. So if I'm an intelligent computer nerd, and hackers, I will, and I want to spread out a virus for any reason, I will not actually introduce that in my web page account and no one look at it. I will introduce in place such Google, Facebook, and so forth. Again, there are problems in the structure of this network in terms of attack. Uh, uh, you can stop me anytime if you have a question, okay? <coughs> They grow for preferential attachment, the rich get richer. And I'll give you some example. And they have synchronization or harmonic behavior. Uh, that is my favorite example. Let's say if we start to clap our hand here, considering as a uh, complex system, sooner or later, without thinking about, we will synchronize with each other. If you go in an opera, when someone starts clapping, and then everyone clapping synchronization, you never notice that? It's true. And that is a property of complex system. Like the cricket, the little insect when they start one, two, three, and then they synchronize themselves to uh, make that noise all synchronized. We don't know why it is happen. It's pretty fascinating, but we don't know. Okay, and modularity. So complex systems are built by different components that tend to form modules. So here an example of emerging property, what I mean. So that is a bird let's say single component, you can study the physiology, everything, the genetics, the genomic of this bird, 
But then if you f ask the question, for instance, how this bird fly long distance or uh, protect itself against pr other bird or predator, that is the way they do it. All these birds, that is this different bird of the same species, they fly like this, you know why? First, because it's faster, they cut the hair much faster, and then if, if there is an eagle and you see this thing, it looks like a bigger <laughs> bird. So seriously, okay? It's a text again, study a single bird or a couple of these birds, you will never come in out with this emergent property. Here another example, picture took it by me in the Red Sea. That's a flock of, uh, of uh, fish, they spin around, you know why? To create a siphon to bring the food up. Again, if you study one of these fish, you can study the entire career, study one fish, but you will never figure out what's going on when they're together. So they are robust. Uh, well, we know airplanes so somehow are robust, but this is a beautiful elegant experiment done back in the 2008, where they took the yeast, the 6,000 gene of the yeast, and systematically they removed one of the gene at the time, so they create 6,000 roughly uh, strain or yeast without a gene, and then they measure the fitness, how the yeast grow without a gene, you know, for all the 6,000 gene, one at a time. And surprisingly, you expect that, you know, you have 6,000 gene, compact genome, non-intron, and so forth. All the genes are important. If you remove one, the, the probability that the yeast doesn't grow or die is very high. But actually, no. You can remove up to 63% of the gene without any effect on the fitness of the yeast. So we're wondering why we have so many genes, right? If you can remove uh, more than half and still the yeast is happy and uh, grow. So that is the robustness. Uh, I explain also the other example with the SNPs in more complex genome. Modularity, that's the easy part. So here is a radio. You can easily see that it's built by models. One, two, three, four, and so forth. Here is a biological system. That is, a, I think, this bacteria. That is a flagella. And that is how the flagella inside the network, if you like, uh, we have three models. The one that is sensing the environment to see where the food is, the one that translates the information from outside to inside, uh, to what? To the flagella that make the uh, uh, bacteria moving towards the food. Okay, and again, three different models co regulated by three different ways. So, that's the concept of complex system. So we know now the human body is a complex system, the airplane and so forth, the, this one is a complex system. So how we can study, visualize, and mathematically analyze complex system in a way that for biologists, for instance, or medical doctor, you know, we saw throughout this uh, summer school so far, very beautiful picture of network. Okay, so I think that I don't need to do too much introduction. So network science is uh, science that dealing with the analysis and visualization of complex network, uh, spanning through different disciplines, uh, statistics, sociology, geometry, computer science, and of course, biology. So, what is the, uh, how you can say, what is the, uh, the idea behind the computer, uh, sorry, the network science that everything is connected. So again, in a complex system, all the models like the internet, the World Wide Web, the social network, and of course, also inside, for instance, uh, um <coughs> in the human body or animals, protein-protein uh, interaction. All the protein are connected to each other in some way. And that is work that Jasper and I, for instance, a long time ago, we did a lot of work on protein-protein interaction. So how this network, again, sorry for uh, be pedantic here, how they are visualized. We have a node that could be a protein or me, and we have an interaction between nodes that could be a physical interaction between protein, uh, Genetic interaction, if a GY study, so uh, like a epistatic relationship, for instance, or could be a, a social interaction, the fact that we know each other because we are in the same room. Co so keep in mind, could be also direction and undirection and so forth. So using this type of visualization, you can visualize different type of system, from social system to protein protein interaction yeast, the economical system, and so forth. So network provide a universal language to describe the spare system, not only to describe, but also to analyze, and I will come back in a second. So here are some example of network. That is the traffic network, each of the nodes. Now here is a city, and each of the age or link is the fact that there is a plane fly from that city to the other city, okay? And that is a, 
traffic network, okay? I show several networks, I show you that's amazingly, although built by different modules or in different entity, they show similar property. Here is the dating network in the high school, so pink are the girl and the uh, blue are the guy, you can see the structure there. So you in the high school apparently you tend to go with the friends of your friends, because it's easy maybe to know. The new man in the Santa Fe Institute, he compared the dating network, the teen network in high school versus the dating network in New York City. You see that in New York City we have apps or bigger node, so more successful female or male for some reason. That we don't see the structure in the in the uh, high school network, it's more linear. So I mean here they cheat less than here, that's what does mean. <laughs> in other words. <laughs> Of course, there is biological network. That is the beautiful network from Eric Davison in Caltech. Probably the first very well characterized and um, validated transcriptional network. In terms of transcriptional network, here is uh, now normally these are transcription factor. And if you see an arrow or a link, uh, that means that transcription factor somehow regulate the expression of the gene during the sea urchin development. Okay. And that's again probably is the most complete, uh, even now, uh, network and the most uh, validated network to date. And that's been built back in 2001, so it's pretty old. And of course, as we learned here from my colleague before, we have also a lot of disease network, like where you show, for example, the disease association network. So where here could be person, like or, or treatment or drugs or gene and interaction could be the fact that those genes they are all somehow mutated or, or malfunctioning in a particular disease or could be a SNPs and so forth. So then the ability, our ability to compare a normal network or a healthy network in a disease case and a perturber network where in this case it is gra as a graphical representation, these nodes somehow they are perturbed compared to the control. So uh, maybe they will give us the opportunity to understand better the disease. So people in the past 20 years show that different type of network or, or, real, or what we call a real network or real world network share the uh, same property, okay, mathematical property. Okay, so before getting to the pro uh, property of the network, because uh, uh, we'll be talking about biology here, so uh, I want to show you how uh, in past few years uh, we were, why we have be able now to talk about biological network. Okay, so because we know now that we collect a lot of information. So we can sequence genome for the SNPs. Oh, sorry. Sorry. We can sequence genome. We can sequence the transcriptome, so then we see which genes are expressed or not, or differential expressing disease versus non disease. We can also sequence the proteome and the metabolome. And you can do all these experiments uh, relatively easily now in any lab, almost in any lab. Uh, but then there is a problem. You end up with very large text file that's uh, with normally number or string of four bases and now you have to computationally model this right and then of course you have to go back and validate this thing in the real world because as we heard throughout this uh, school these are also what we show you in a second these are um, prediction okay their model doesn't mean that it reflects exactly what is the real world or reflect exactly what's behind the data but okay so now we are we are able to collect all these uh, components, okay? But what it tells us is just give a catalogs of the gene or the protein or the metabolite that are present or not present. So in the last few years, there was a big effort from several labs to start to also catalog the interaction among these, okay? So genome-wide, right? So now we can sequence a genome and we can theoretically uh, measure the, pro the interaction of all the protein encoded by the genome. By means, for instance, of protein-protein interaction is through ivory mass pet or protein DNA interaction if you use ChIP-seq. And of course, that is uh, probably the first type of network that we see, you know, the chemistry. When we're going to university and you go to the chemistry professor, you see this gigantic uh, metabolic network. That is a snapshot of that. And of course, you can connect also now if these are enzymes, you can also understand which metabolite they can produce. There is also, uh, and that is um, probably the newest type of uh, biological oriented 
interaction that we can collect genome wide is what is called genetic interaction or genetic interaction. So first of all, it's been done in yeast because it's very simple. In yeast, you can modify them. And people like uh, people in San Francisco, for instance, they did a lot of this work. So you have a single mutant. So like I told you before, the robustness, so you can mutate a gene and that's you reduce the cell fit. That is the yeast, okay? That is cell viability. One is where you have the wild type. And then you have, let's say, your reduction of 60% of the viability, or f s if, you mut if you mutate uh, gene A, gene B, uh, 0.5, then you can do m possible combination in yeast. Try to start to understand the interaction. N keep in mind, these are not really physical interaction, interaction, functional interaction, if you like, of gene A, gene B. For instance, if you cross, that's the expected phenotype, will be reduction of 30% if both gene is additive, right? You have a reduction of 60%, reduction of uh, uh, 50%. If you multiply that, that's the expected phenotype, will be a further reduction up to 30% availability. But people discover quickly that that is not always the case. So you have what is called negative interaction where the effect of the double mutation, could be triple mutation, quadruple mutation, is actually higher than a expected phenotype. In this case, for instance, we have zero. So all the yeast are dead. Or positive interaction somehow, and that is the epistatic relationship, somehow the product of these uh, two mutations improve the fitness. That's, if you think about this unlogically, you say, okay, we have two mutations, if you put it together, you expect that it should be worst, but in this case, increase or, or, or not change much. Okay, so I'll show you. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Depend on the phenotype you check in. So of course you will measure those interactions that are important for cellular fitness, but maybe not for other biological things. But you know, people, not myself, but other people, um they they now they start to do this genetic interaction network yeast uh in under different conditions. For instance, screening different cancerogen no what is called the drug for chemo chemotherapy drugs. Right, because you know, they normally the chemotherapy drug they stop the cell cycle. So then, what they're doing, they use the panel of chemotherapy drug and they do this genetic reaction to try to understand how the network change in present and absent of drugs. As an example, so I show so that's all the type of interaction that we can uh, find in a cell or a living organism. I repeat protein protein interaction, protein interaction, metabolic interaction, genetic interaction. Okay. And that is very important, the ability to collect all these interactions and integrate them too, uh, computationally. So just to show that I'm not out of my mind and I'm not the only one thing the interaction are pro important, this is the intact interaction database. It's a whole slide, uh, but you can see how exponentially grow the number of data set of any type of interaction that people deposit uh, in this database. That show that are not only one thing that the oh, oh, Jasper, maybe it's only two, the thing that interaction are important, okay, between components. And how to measure and study and model in this interaction is something that uh, we should go further. So there is other people, a lot of them. Okay, so that's are the type of interaction we have in biological system. Now, let me step back. So how we can model this interaction? Let's say now we have a protein protein interaction network, okay? So, and I told you before that biological network, like social network and so forth, they share similar property, mathematical property we're not talking about, okay? Uh, similar topology. So where all this is started? So the first, and that is gr come straight from graph theory, that is the first type of network analysis ever done, in his, to my knowledge. Uh, it was a... a um, a city planner in uh, Prussia, now it's Russia, this city, Konigsberg. And uh, the mayor told him, okay, so we have four landmass, one, two, three, four, here. And now we need to build bridge, but we don't have enough money or we want to uh, maximize the viability of people moving from one landmass. So this guy came out with the first ever graphical representation of a network, where now the dot, the nodes, are the landmass and the link here, meaning that there is a bridge between this landmass and this landmass. Okay? And that's the thing, 
doesn't mean much, but uh, it was actually the first ever representation, right? So now, why you know, we saw a lot of imaging like this of uh, uh, feedback loops of so forth, right? So it's, it's the same thing. So basically, you can apply mathematical analysis that you ask how faster the information go from this line mass to the lens mass, being how many people go for every day, or what is the faster information going from a signal transduction uh, network inside a cell. Okay, so that was the first ever, and also well, and introduce the graphical representation, and also introduce the concept of node degree. So, like, what is the degree of this node? Is three. So, how many interaction coming out or coming in from that node? But then we have to wait four decades for the first really mathematical. Uh, and again, maybe I'm pedantic here, but all these things I told you is important to understand the, the the tools that we use and we'll present in a second to analyze uh, complex system. So we have to wait almost four decades, right? When these two guys, Erdo Rini, probably familiar with the Erdos number, they come now, so they were thinking, I don't know why, but they start to think about natural network or real world network, they grow, okay, randomly, okay? Basically, if you given a n number of uh, nodes uh, here, and uh, each node have uh, the same probability to interact with other nodes, if you look, the total distribution of this interaction is a Poisson correlation, right? That's K is the number of interaction. So uh, the example of before was three in that lemma mass. And here, the PK is the probability of how this interact. And you see, if uh, the network is random, you have a Poisson distribution, okay? And that was the first model of real-world network, or the postulation of real-world network. The problem with this guy, they were very clever, and they uh, now the random network, it's called Erdos Rini random network, used as a benchmark, negative benchmark with the real-world network, okay? So it, they didn't waste their time. But, uh, you know, the problem back in the 59, what this guy didn't have, all the data we have now. Not only biological data, but also social data, like the internet, so forth. So for them, try to simulate or analyze the network uh, was a problem because they don't have data. So they need to come now with, uh, this is a um, computational model, it's not real. So uh, another thing that they introduced that is very important for real network is the percolation uh, um, score. The percolation score is that's in random network is one, is the fraction of giant component that you can form if you simulate the network growing from the number of interaction. Uh, you know, if you plot it against the connection per node, right? So basically, you can see that there is a, a threshold where you start to form in a network giant, giant component. Okay, so you understand what I mean here? Again, this is important for the prediction I'll show you later. So let me write here. Well, I don't have another here. So the percolation threshold, let's say we have now a small network like here, here. So that plot show how many interaction you need to add to the network to start to create a giant component like this one. Well, that is not giant, but I don't have a lot of space to write. Okay. Yeah, it could be modules, correct? So the, their formulation, it, it was like how the network they grow. So, and uh, how you characterize a network that is a network, it's not a bunch of inter uh, like entities that are not very like, connected, is to create a giant component in terms of the majority of the interaction, or the nodes are interact at least one, because that was based also on the randomness of the model. But that is used uh, a lot by Barbasi, for instance. Okay. And that is the same thing, uh, the same concept in physics when the eye, water turns in ice, percolation. So you know how it's working. If you take a glass of ice, you put it in the freezer. So it's not that it freeze immediately everything. You have seed around, right? And you, for some, depend on the water, the impurity, and so forth. You need to have a certain number of seed here, certain number of interaction, in order to convert or, or, or push the faint transition from water to uh, to ice. So uh, that is percolation. And that is true for any uh, change in phase, right? So that was, be, was great. But again, we have to wait, again, four decades before other people took serious this model and start to apply to r uh, important 
a question in uh, whatever sociology or and actually come from a bunch of uh, kids in a college in US that for a game they decide to uh, look at uh, the uh, actor network so they noticed that um, Kevin Bacon uh, was very uh, was present in a lot of movie especially back in the 70s and the 80s so then they start to count how many um, actress or actor they uh, in uh, they just play in a movie with him and connect as a network and then connect also those actors and actors that they play together not necessarily with Kevin Bacon and then they calculate the average number of interaction at was six degrees so basically to go from this actor to Kevin Bacon you have to have uh, you know uh, no six people in the network Okay, that seemed like a, it was a joke, right? It was a group of uh, students in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in college. But then this too clever guy, right, from at the time was Cornell University, now he's the director of Yahoo, uh, and uh, Watson and Strogatz. Uh, so what they say, they look at the uh, Erdo Serini model, the random network, and the Kevin Bacon network. Also, these two guys were lucky because at the time they have access to bigger network and more data for mathematical analyze them. So what they noticed that the random uh, model of Erdogini, so like the probability of a node to have the, uh, a certain number of interaction is equal for all the nodes, it didn't fit in what they noticed that in the actor network, for instance, the Kevin Bacon network, there was clustering, like there was a clustering of ages like modules like uh, he mentioned before well, uh, where there are regions of the network uh, of which node tend to interact more between each other than other region of the network okay and that is called clustering coefficient that was the first time was formulated for instance what is the classic coefficient of this example if they want to know the classic coefficient of the blue no uh, nodes right is the number of real interaction between the blue and uh, so a number of possible interactions here represented by dotted uh, edges over the number of uh, interaction between the blue and the neighbors. Okay, that's it zero, it's not cluster. That's is one, everything is connected. Okay, so uh, that's it. Huh? Also, what they noticed, and, and that was uh, the base of the six degree, the mathematical formulation of, so the, uh, the small world network are network represented here, that's are between the random network where everything tends to be connected in the same way, more or less, or the same probability, to regular lattice, like uh, diamond connection, you know, the molecular connection of the diamond. And they what they study, they study three different real networks, the Kevin Bacon network, the power grid in US, so the and the C elegant protein protein interaction network. And what they notice versus comparing with so the random network. What they notice is that all these network, the real network compared to the random, are characterized as small average path lengths. So go from one place to another is very fast, the six degree separation, and an high cluster coefficient. Okay? And again, that is important for later. A few years later, I had a two clever guy based on this three num uh, three network and also the World Wide Web. So they come out, they also notice a different thing compared to uh, the random network model Erdo Serini. That's uh, a real uh, network show high degree of self-organization. So they are small world, they have clustering coefficient, they tend to be clustered, they tend to not be random. But also the actor collaboration, World Wide Web, Power Grid, they also show this, if you plot now the log log scale of the number of interaction of each node over the probability of interaction, instead to show the portion distribution, they show a power law. Power law meaning that they go down here, long tail, right? And that's introduced another big concept that's important for what we are interested in, in, in a link prediction. Uh, in import in introduce the concept of preferential attachment. So what this plot they tell us is that if you look at the majority of real network, there are the majority of the, the interaction, sorry, the nodes, there are few interaction, but there is few nodes that have a high interaction, number of interaction, and that's are called the apps of the network. And that's also the postulate in the same paper, uh, the how the network grow, not as the Erdo reading model where depend on the number of nodes, you have an increased number of interaction, 
correct? Because if you increase the number of nodes and if you know there's the same probability to interact, the network will grow bigger. So, but then test show that the scale-free property. Scale-free meaning that the network, they don't grow. Uh, if you add a node, the number of interaction you add is not proportional to the number of nodes, scale-free, right? Why? Because the probability that you add the apps is very low because there are very few apps compared to the rest of the nodes that have few interaction. So if you consider the network dynamic, how it's growing in terms of number of interaction, right? If it's random, if you add, depend on the number of, uh, or the size of the network, if you add a node, and the node have a probability to interact with all the other nodes the same way. <coughs> so there is a proportional growing also of the in number of interactions compared to the number of nodes. If it's scale-free, scale-free because it doesn't scale with uh, the number of nodes, the probability that you add an app of the network is very low. That is an important point. The other important point was now we can postulate, that's they postulate, that the network grow for preferential attachment. And again, that is another important concept uh, for the methods we developed before. Preferential attachment, what does it mean? So the prob again, the probability that an app gain a new interaction is higher, okay? Then the probability uh, the the another um, node in the network get an interaction. And it's the concept that the richer get richer. The, the app be the rich guy with a lot of interaction, is norm or the actor with very good, so there is more probability that that actor is actually uh, will play more movie than a, a new actor that is not even very good, okay? Or if you invest your money in the stock exchange, if you went a lot and you get a bigger return, they invest a little, little money in different things. Okay, so that's the preferential attachment. So, and that is the last introduction slide. Another important discovery that is important for topological prediction of interaction is coming from Newman, very clever guy from Santa Fe Institute. Uh, he's a sociologist, so he studies social network. And in these two plots are similar. So what he count is look at the uh, co-citation network from scientists in Santa Fe, uh, the Institute of Santa Fe. So basically what he plot, the number of common, it was interesting about the Barabasi preferential attachment and common neighbor. A theory. So number of common neighbors, so how many, so I for each of the pair of nodes, here he plot pair of nodes, for each of the pair of nodes he count how many common neighbors they have. Common neighbor meaning how many other nodes that have a list and interaction with one of these two, okay? So that is common neighbor. And uh, the, uh, the probability of those two scientists to in the future maybe publish a paper together or to collaborate, okay? because of the field, or what they're doing, or because they are all in Santa Fe, or, or, or for other reasons. And surprisingly, what we show here, that if you tend to have more common neighbor, it's not surprise, but that is the first formulation, mathematical formulation. If you have more common neighbor, you have higher chance to collaborate with a colleague than know a lot of your colleague. Okay? So if you have, if you have a lot of friends in common, it's most likely to have become your friend. That is the concept. And again, that is another proof of the preferential attachment uh, mechanism of network growth. But also, now it tells us that there is an inherent topological structure of the network that is scale-free small world that can, or cluster coefficient, that can be used to predict, now we can predict interaction, not only analyze them, because now we can count the number of common neighbor, let's say, this example, we want to predict the if there is an interaction and with some kind of scoring uh, between uh, X and Y. So what, what the uh, new one postulate, the common neighbor approach, so we count how many neighbor we have, three. And that is the link, so they have a probability that is ranked at three. You know, if this one, they have more neighbor, maybe, the pro well, maybe uh, based on Newman, the probability increase. Okay, so and that is uh, just to uh, see co complexity, but that is how uh, you formulate the preferential attachment. Again, if you want to predict if there is Y and X, you know, they interact uh, based on Barbasi preferential attachment, we just count the number of interaction of X and multiply by the number of interaction of Y. And again, that gives you an idea about the, um, 
the em small environment where they are. More they are the interaction, meaning that the region of the network are more connected, and therefore it's more likely they also teach you the interact. That's what does mean. Again, if you put a lot of people inside the same room, a lot they know each other, a lot they don't know, but the probability that I come to know one of the people in the room is higher. And that is the modules, for instance, uh, what you mentioned, the concept. Okay, so preferential attachment and common neighbor are the first two predictor that have been developed for uh, link prediction. Link prediction is the question simple. How I can predict if these two genes or these two proteins or these two SNP, they interact together or they have a function together in a particular biological context, for example, a cancer or so forth. So that is a very important problem. Very simple, but very important. Another thing that is very important, and that is an example of the cluster coefficient or the ability of to predict. Here is, for example, is uh, uh, the network where we plot the uh, cluster coefficient of three different cancer in normal cell on cancer cell, or normal patient or, or cancer patient. So the normal patient are the dotted one, okay? And the what you can see, and that's the uh, probability of coefficient, what you can see that when we have in this, at least in three, three cancer, when we have some kind of mutation or some kind of uh, disease, the co-regulation, that is expression data by, uh, based on transcriptomics. So the co-regulation and therefore the cluster coefficient of uh, certain set of genes that are important in the particular system crash. So the network starts to decompose itself. That's what it does mean, okay? So there is also a correlation, I mean, people see correlation between disease or particular cellular state uh, and the overall topology of the network, okay? And that's a very nice data to show in three different experiments. It's published. Okay, so another important thing here, for example, another important example, that is a, a, a social network, but still from Santa Fe, still from Yuma. So now that we know the topology of the network, we know preferential attachment, classic coefficient, power law, small world. So now we can also start to predict how the information flow through the network, okay? Based on the analysis of the structure of the network. For instance, there is a um, parameter that is called centrality. So tell you how, m so how central is that node in the network. If you take any node randomly, so give, you, give me a number that is an indication of how is in the center of the network. Why that is important? Let's look at this. That's our people in different uh, discipline of study or research in Santa Fe. So what you we can see here immediately, this information, this network, means that statistical physics is so important among different or bridging different disciplines that in order for these people to collaborate, then you also need to go through the statistical physics people. Okay? So again, that is a collaboration network, but you know, if that's the information network or GPS network or so forth, you plot it there, you want to see where to put a tower to increase the signal between here and Stockholm, here. Or if you want to direct the signal or the GPS or the radar, whatever, right? Even Im more important thing than the collaboration network. Or, as Barbasi showed us, if you want to uh, define the, uh, those genes that are central or particular phenomenon, uh, biological phenomenon, including disease, again, you can calculate the bitterness and centrality and start to see uh, where the information flow. So, I mean, these are important concepts, and I think are important, and important, para simple, but very important parameter that allow us to now better design models computational models, mathematical models, for the prediction of interaction. So, sorry, again. So what is the top topological link prediction? So topological because it's based on the topology of the network, scale-free, small work, cluster coefficient, and so forth, those topological parameters. And why we care to predict a link between two nodes? Well, depend on the discipline, but that is simple. So now we want to come out with an algorithm that's from that is the observed network. So let's say the network that you showed this morning, you know, the network that uh, uh, people measure protein-protein interaction, right? So the data we have now, and 
we say, okay, that is what we measure, but that is the real network, the final network, or somehow we miss some information. Like in this case, they say some of the report in the database are not complete or different, so right? How we can come in out with a prediction if this could be a real interaction or this one and this one, and also how you can validate that computationally before wasting time in the lab. So that's the concept or my concept of topological in prediction. It's an important concept not only for me, for instance, this is the Facebook. So you guys have Facebook, right? So, uh, uh, you know, when Facebook say you have n uh, nine mutual friends, that is again, it's a link prediction. Facebook run underneath the network or the social network, and based on number of common neighbor you have with some other your friends, it gives you a prediction that you may know that person. Okay, so that is actually what happened. That is, is uh, actually Facebook is working on common neighbor, as I showed you before. That is how you use it, it's a simple algorithm. Another example outside biology is Netflix. So you know Netflix, you can download a movie, but when you download a movie or series, then it says, you may like this. Uh, it proposed you that maybe you like a movie. How? Again, run common neighbor and see what are the other movies you downloaded and which other movie, other people that download the same movie downloaded too. And then you say, maybe this guy have or girl have the same taste in movie than uh, the, the other, okay? So uh, the link prediction problem is, is true for uh, medical purpose, but also more so apply thing like social uh, network. Okay, so that's already shown. Now, that's it, uh, define the problem, the question, okay? So the my question is not biological because I'm not very expert in any biological thing. So my question is, can we improve and generalize uh, tools, computational tools, for prediction of link between two nodes. And uh, honestly, I don't care if the nodes are uh, so person or uh, disease. Okay, we try different things. But in my case, it's try to come up with a better, faster method. Okay? So that's is what I like to do. So of course, we are not the only one doing this kind of analysis in the world. Uh, Newman, for example, is the guy who started. But for instance, here is a list of, uh, just to reference also when you can get my slide of what is general purpose neighborhood based technique these are all prediction link the link prediction technique based on some kind of topological assumption of the network that some people use for general purpose for mean normally social network economical network and so forth so that is the one that people use mostly for predict the co-occurrence of two stock in the stock exchange so it can make a lot of money uh, and that's not designed by us, that's they were already there. Again, mostly coming from social science or economical science. And then there are a few uh, that I call them bio-inspired neighborhood-based technique uh, because are technique that's been developed by colleagues to study biological network, okay? There was one was more social network and that's the biological network, okay? And here is the the definition so this one is important and this one is important because in particular for this one we modify the this is called Tchaikovsky dice this uh, distant matrix is is not a correlation with the distant matrix and also this one the fs weight because they have this penalty here if you understand but it, i mean i would don't go through the mathematics i can show you later if you want but for a matter of time so here in the denominator there is this gamma this gamma is important because and that's what inspire also our method of inventor. Because here is a penalty that tells you that if that's to calculate what is the probability of two nodes to interact, all these and the one before, okay? To give a number of the probability of interaction. But here this guy, they make a score that give a penalty, so a lower score, if the two nodes you want to predict the interaction, they tend to don't have common neighbor or to tend to be in a region of the network that are very sparse or very distant between each other, okay? So basically it's the first index that taking into account the uh, locality or, or, or the neighboring uh, of, the, of the network. So now, so the again, so that is already told, sorry. Shouldn't remove this. So basically, to cut a long story short, I introduce all those topological uh, predictor or topological property. So the, the, the question is how we can predict this based on the topology of the network. Now we know that the network are not random. 
okay, are no erdoserini, the network are scale free, okay, or small word. So how the link predicts all the list of things or uh, equation I show you, how it's working very simple. You have a network, you ask the predictor, please predict what is the probability to have an interaction between A to D or B to D, and then you rank any of the prediction technique, then you rank the uh, prediction based on the higher score or lower uh, probability, or higher probability, sorry, to the lower, okay? So that's a candidate into the interaction that the link, or sorry, the method predict, and then you have some kind of score. So we find difficulty to define the score, that is very important. So how I can be confident that if I put a cutoff here, only the first interaction, for fourth interaction, are actually meaningful, biological, for instance, or important, okay? So then we come out with a uh, prune rediscover performance evaluation. Again, that is to, uh, and because all the graph I show you now, the real data, they, they show this graph. That is a, a simple thing. So we have, uh, let's say, for example, we have a reference uh, ages that we know they are real in the network. Let's say prot prot interaction network, a list of 100 that we know that people validate in the lab by uh, not only each two ivory, but single experiment. So like interaction that we know, for example, the ribosomal protein that we know they all interact together somehow and so forth. Right? That's something that you know and you're sure, you're confident that's a real interaction. And then you run the predictor and you ask and you count the precision. So how many of those known interaction or real interaction my predictor uh, recover are in the top of the list, okay? So that's because prune rediscover, you know, because you ask to the algorithm to rediscover things as you know. And then you can put the precision, that is defined by this, for each predictor, and the function, ah, okay, so that is the other thing is important. A lot of these predic uh, predictor, they work, um, you know, based on, uh, as I told you, the topological property of the network. If the network can be very dense, like a lot of interaction, or very sparse, like where the nodes are very connected. And uh, we noticed that a lot of these predictors, they're working very well with very dense network, and again, no surprise, but they don't work with sparse network. So we need to have a, a number that tell us also the uh, precision of this method, in, you know, compared to the fraction of the edges we remove. So if you remove more edges, so if you go from here to here, you sparsify the network, okay? And then the curve is the prediction is, b is very good in any type of uh, network structure, it will be like this, right? More deeper this curve, meaning that's the, the predictor uh, software of network sparsification. Why network specification? Why we bother? It's a long story, but because when study biological network, as you know better than me, they are very sparse. They are not like the internet. They are not like Facebook. They are very, very sparse network because, you know, to collect the all the experimental data, take ages, there is full positive, full negative problem, for example, in protein protein interaction, genetic interaction in human, so it's difficult to collect them, so they have tend to be very sparse. So it's important that we have a feeling of how it is working in sparse network. So, and that is the because of the reason, for example, if you study genetic interaction in human, it's difficult to collect all the information or to trust all the data. So, for example, here, show some statistic about the i triple protein protein interaction published in 2009-2010. Oh no, that's the genetic interaction. And it shows you, you see how many we're missing, okay? And or the sporules, the one that uh, are interaction only among two regions, uh, the network, but they don't have clustering coefficient or they're very sparse. So they feel they, they have this problem, this biological network. So, okay. So another another way that we evaluate the network, sorry, I should have put this one premium. You can select a set of interactions that are well known. But sometimes that is a problem because how y you know you you're not confident if that interest for example for protein protein interaction a little bit more confident but for genetic interaction how you really define that two interaction they function and interact together for instance in human it's very difficult to create a gold standard list that you're confident enough to use to test your software okay so another way to do it not devised by us but, but devised by another guy it is a saito is uh, 
using gene ontology, for instance, or other information, co-expression. Simple uh, uh, concept, right? If two genes, we, interact the pre we predict the interaction, they also tend to be co-expressed always in the same tissue or part of the same pathway or in the same cellular uh, compartment, right? It's more likely that the interaction is true. If you have two proteins that you predict to be interacting, but one is nuclear, the other one is on the cell membrane, maybe you have a problem, okay? Or one is only expressing subtype of neuron and the other one express only in liver. So maybe they can physically interact, but they never present together, so we don't care, okay? So that was the concept. And again, you're doing exactly the same uh, curve under the, the so area under the precision curve, where instead now to, uh, you know, uh, you rank a base of some goal relevant. So if yes, no, yes or no, okay? And guilty by association method. And that you have a precision curve. So number of PPI taken is how many of the top number, because you have to throw a cut off after a while. So you have to take in order to have a precision curve. But it's the same concept to the other, okay? Now, that's our the way that we evaluate the methods, prediction method. Now I will introduce the methods we published recently. So first, this one. So that is called uh, a CAR index. And uh, again, it's based on clustering coefficient or local community. It's a small variation of the clustering coefficient, a small variation, big variation of clustering coefficient. So again, here we have the same problem, how we can uh, predict uh, if X and Y they interact together in a certain network context. That is the real neighborhood, okay? So, and we call it in this uh, paper, we call it this one, the local community of the network. So you have a lot of local community, of course, because depend on the size of the network. So, and then you, of course, you look the local community and the local uh, community link. So how, not only the neighborhood, but also how the three other nodes, they interact together. So we add another level of restriction, not only the neighborhood, but also the neighbor need to interact together, not with other. So here is how the formulation, but it's important. Sorry. Okay, that is the same one, I skipped the mathematics. So based on that simple intuition, we then try our method, the CAR index, on different biological and non-biological networks. First of all, we want to see the, uh, the neuron connectome, that is done uh, in Switzerland, where people study the connection of the neuron live in the mouse, and this beautiful data set. So uh, here, how they look at the connection, it's nice. Uh, so that is not, not from the paper, of course. Uh, and uh, so now we ask the question, can we find local community structure there? Can we find, um, you know, prediction of link, link prediction between neuron. So we done that basically to cut a story in short and we see that our uh, predictor work better than other, in particular, if you specify the network. We try this on different network, of course, different uh, neuron cortical um, brain network, but also social network. And this is the car or the adjusted other index. Trust me, so to don't go in details, so here, the working better. So that was the first prediction that we did. But also when we did this prediction, what we noticed that based on the local community score, that is our predictor, so you can separate all the 78 network that we uh, study in two different type of network. What we call heterogeneous dynamic system that are uh, difficult to control, a lot of biological system are here, or social network. And the one that's a very small index, uh, of communi community, local community structure. That's our more homogeneous, stable system, easy to control. The power grid in the middle, the highest is here, the roadmap, the diamond, and so forth. So that was like, a, okay, now, if you see this network doesn't, that's surprise, but at least now we have an index that you can use to separate this network. Well, the, the local paradigm, yes, so we postulate that this is also the controllability of the network. So how, uh, this network, they need to carry information from one side to another compared to this that's normally a more stable. So that was a surprise. That was not something that we were looking at. So we were looking at predictor using local community. And then when we generate a plot, the local community score versus, to see the correlation, right? Just a test. We noticed the strike line, so all the network we try, they just divide in two. 
So, and, uh, so then we postulated that that could be an important local community uh, uh, structure of the network, right? So we postulate a, a different type of community uh, in the network. So now you can use, for example, the car to classify a specific network. And if you have other information on those networks, let's say, for example, how fast you want to transfer the information and so forth, you can first split that based on the car or the community paradigm. And, and then start to study the property and start to try to understand if is uh, why that is the reason why you transfer the information less faster uh, and so forth. So for example, you, we didn't do that, but uh, that is something that you can use. So basically with this uh, project, so we uh, develop a new family of topological limb predictor, car index, uh, and the Tchaikovsky die modification I didn't talk about, uh, novel netto statistic, the local community paradigm, so that is can be considered like uh, the classical coefficient and so forth. And as you show, separate the network very nicely based on some real property, real network. Then we also tackle another problem published here. So we developed a long time ago this algorithm is called minimum curvilinearity. I developed one, I cannot even pronounce it. So, uh, and uh, this is basically is a dimensionality reduction technique come to from uh, noise uh, reduction, let's say, uh, imaging analysis, right? It's machine learning based. So uh, it's based on network embedding. So, and then we say, okay, we can use the minimal conveniality to, uh, as a tool, or a modified minimal conveniality for prediction of protein protein interaction in protein protein interaction network. So that's the question we ask here. So again, I don't introduce anymore the protein protein interaction uh, concept. And also the problem, and let's come back to your question, the problem we have here, you know, the sparses, the full positive, the full negative. So is our MC, now I call it MC, uh, is better than other, or it can predict interaction also in sparsified networks or in networks that are prone to be uh, high frequency of full positive? So how network inventing is working, that is not developed by us, it's developed independently by these two guys, it's called Isomap. So let's say you have a network here, and you assume that the network is a high dimensional space, right? And now you want, that is uh, developed for link prediction. So in order to uh, make faster the algorithm, or in order to um, reduce the, or increase the probability that you get it right in the prediction, so what this guy with Isomap did is, basically um, embed the network in a lower dimensional space. This is like a PCA, right? Try to squash the data that are three-dimensional data or like in different dimension data in a two-dimension data. So that's what this thing does. And that is a problem is described here, for example. So, I mean, that is how people look the hurt, right? Before we know that was spherical. But in order to see, because, you know, we can only see plane, but uh, in order to see the Earth like a real sphere, you have to go on the moon. So that's the thing. The dimensionality reduction is like squashing in lower dimension a complex system that you go uh, look for the top. That's the concept. There are different dimensionality reduction techniques. So the problem with isomap that we noticed uh, is a clever argument is that because of the reduction of the space, if two nodes, if uh, you will predict this interaction that are in a region where the two nodes don't have a lot of common interaction as part, so based on our theory, most likely to be not real, and you put it in a lower dimensional space, this technique, what they're doing, they will put these two um, nodes very close. And how you assess if those two nodes interact, normally you calculate the Euclidean distance or some shorter path. Therefore, that is an artifact because in the real tr uh, spaces, they are not close, and but when you squash it, it that is, is a problem, all dimensional reduction technique. But how we can avoid that, right? The isomap problem. So we applied this non-centered minimum coveniality and bending, again, a uh, dimensionality reduction technique. That is our network that's represented in three-dimensional space, for instance, so before the embedding. So then we, again, our problem is what are the likelihood of this interaction. So what we're doing, we generate a, a MC kernel matrix that in this case, we basically, to cast, uh, how you say an easy word, instead to uh, squash in a two-dimensional space, we first extracted the minimum spanning tree. So the distance 
between those nodes in order to avoid this problem. The distance between this one and this one in the real network and so forth, okay? That is something that they didn't do it. So that is called minimum spanning tree. And then you generate a matrix, an um, MC kernel matrix. And then you have the problem, again, like the isomap, once you have this minimum spanning tree, you have to calculate the distance. So you can do between the dots, uh, the nodes. And the distance theoretically representing the probability of the interaction in a lower dimensional space. So you can calculate in two ways, the Euclidean distance, or this is this, that is how uh, it's done by isomap, or looking for shorter path. Okay, so basically, if I go from this one to this one in only one uh, con or two connection, this, this one are more likely to interact. Again, because of the concept I explained before, the clustering uh, phenomenon or the community phenomenon we see in the, in the real world network. Okay, so we try in different data set, prot prot interaction data set. That is uh, isomap versus minimum MC. First of all, what we did is, uh, so MC, what it does is also a way, because the minimum spanning tree, to avoid that this sampling, or we consider those uh, interaction or those nodes that are close, because in a sparse area, because there is only one interaction between each other. And that is how many times in four different networks, our algorithm compared with isomat tested that sparse region of the network. So what it tells us this plot is our method at least doesn't know if we're better than other or the other one, but at least we avoid using the shorter path and minus spanning tree, we avoid uh, the problem of sampling region of the network that are not connected and therefore getting a dimensionality reduction that could be a full positive. That is what we saw here in all network. This is a real network. Eh? So again, for limited time, we test it in several networks. So the MC is always in red. There is also a variation non center and centered, but I can discuss that later on. It's a technical details. And you can see that in all networks tend to perform better. And again, that is the specification, right? Number of PPI or interaction we remove over the precision under the curve. So what is shown here compared to other methods, especially isomap, that's our technique is less prone to sparsification of the network. So the network tend to be more sparse, our technique is more robust. Why? Because we avoid the problem I told you uh, uh, of the non-sample, we don't sample the region that's as sparse. That is another test. I mean, these are a little bit boring, so just believe me, you know, it tend to work better. Ah, so, so yeah, that is uh, advanced manifold learning. So other technique that are, uh, again, uh, for dimensionality reduction. So we try, so we compare, that's the reason why I have this uh, plot, I forgot about it. So <laughs> we compare our method against uh, isomap, for instance, or also uh, other dimensionality reduction technique that are more common. And yeah, again, it's working better, almost in all networks, if it's not in all networks. And that's a supervised method of machine learning. Okay, we compare that as uh, uh, the MC versus uh, the CD Satosity dice, and so the neighbor-based technique invented for biological network. And again, here is working very well with these two networks, but then here, and I have to admit, it doesn't perform better on, uh, on these two networks. Why? These two networks were very, very sparse for some reason it didn't work out. So we also validate our prediction uh, using, for example, the Go. Uh, we download the string interaction, the one that we predict on the real network to be real based on our method and see uh, how or how they are present in in, uh, in uh, this string database, probably the most complete prot prot interaction database. And also we overlap the gene ontology. And you can see here the recovery protein and the string confidence that gave you so the confidence calculated by string and the go gene ontology confidence. So it's also try to pull out again the prediction. I don't think that all of these are real. They need to be validated, but it's working kind of well. So in this aspect, we develop a novel network embedding based link predictor. It's good for PPI. Um, so before I go to the last part, uh, yes, I have time. 
So I want to say that now I show you all this predictor method, right? And I show you with what we tested. But the idea is that if you have any type of network, this is network, any type of data set, and you want to predict if 20 then interact, the idea is that you, you can use this tool to do so. Okay? So we just show you uh, the one that we published because that was the network that we studied, we added. So, but if you have your own network, like a lot of people show already here, uh, even in the poster, and if you are interested to predict, uh, you know, if there is a kind of functional interaction or possible physical interaction, you can use all of this network, uh, uh, sorry, method, and depend on the size of the network, the density, the type of data. So you can ask me, I can tell you which one will be better, okay? The methods. So now, genetic interaction network. And that is actually part because of the title of my presentation. So I already introduced the genetic interaction network. Yeah, yeah, so they're all published. So there is a list of publications there. So you can go and download the codes in the material and method. They are all run in MATLAB. So they're not fancy. I mean, uh, we, gen we didn't generate a package. If you ask me, like uh, uh, software visualization or something, they're all code that are in MATLAB. You can easily download it. But then you have to generate your own plot and everything with whatever, normally MATLAB. They're not really easy to use for uh, non-computer scientists, so you need to have a, a little bit of programming skill, even to prepare the file. But we can help. If you need it, we can help. But they're all free available. Okay, so genetic interaction also here. We have a problem, even higher. They're missing a lot of them. That's a prediction done by Costanzo and Alt in science, and 40% of that tend to be non-real or false positive. Okay? So that's, again, we have, uh, like, Protein protein interaction, genetic interaction in yeast, in C. elegans 4, in human, they, they are networked, they tend to be very noisy. That is the point. So, the data set we use, so uh, the first, of course, we try in two simple organisms, yeast and uh, uh, C. elegant. Okay, so again, we test the different mm, prediction method, including our, and see. Now we tested everything together here. And what we can see, so the uh, general purpose, biological one, and uh, the, you know, we saw that the, um, what is called, this one is the modified uh, index, so it's working better, that's modified by us. And if you look at the network and bending, again, our, is okay, but not be much better than other. And again, it feel a little bit of the sparsity. So, uh, that's uh, sorry. That is for the uh, warm network. That network average is five. So now, and meaning that this network, the warm, is more sparse uh, than the east. That is 27. So again, with the east. Uh, our method of like, for example, this one, the Tchaikovsky modify or the minimal covilinearity is working, but again, non improving uh, uh, compared to others. So, here I'm honest, seem to that these methods, all the one developed, they're working very well with uh, uh, protein protein interaction, social network, uh, but they don't work better than others that's already up there if you look uh, genetic interaction network. Ask me why, I don't have idea. So they are supposed probably how this network are generated. Okay, so here is another show that's uh, uh, on genetic network doing sparsification of the network. Our modified Tchaikovsky ACCD uh, can get an improvement even in sparse network like the warm network or less sparse network of 10 and 60 percent compared to the best method discovered by this. Uh, during this uh, experiment. Okay, for a matter of time, I'll show you, probably for you more interesting, uh, when we apply some of these methods, but also a, a new one that we presented here, and also this one is, is published, so uh, to a genetic interaction network in human. So why we, uh, we will construct genetic interaction network in human? Because there is, as you know, a uh, relationship between genotype and phenotype uh, because are important for human disease and personalized treatment. And I swear I didn't prepare this slide only because of this uh, thing. So 
What is GWAS? So we know that GWAS are multi-billion dollar project, okay? So you sequence a cohort of uh, 10,000 patients, uh, healthy or for a particular disease, and then the idea was the main goal is to find correlation between variation or single nucleotide, nucleotide variation or inversion uh, with the disease. So that was a simple idea of the GWAS, right? It was a promise. How will you do it? Well, now, no SNPs array, but sequencing, again, you have the two cohort, I mean, I don't need to tell you this to you guys, okay? So then, statistically, what he's doing, you just find a fetal logic regression and try to correlate the if the mutation in locus A uh, is somehow correlated with the sample tree that is a disease or no disease and so forth, okay? And then you have a, l a, a list of SNPs that maybe they match a gene or not, uh, that are ranked based on this linear fitting, right? So higher are the ones that tend to be more correlated with the, the disease, for instance. For example, is present always in the patient that have a particular type of disease. We know that that is not the case in the real world. Matter of fact, uh, the reason why we decide to explore different methods to study GY studies is because talking with these guys, for example, I don't go into details, so these are guys that they criticize the, the, the effort of GYS consortia, uh, every GYS consortia in the last 10 years. So, you know, as you know, it was a promise that we have find the, the cure all the disease. This didn't happen, it didn't even improve that much. Why? Well, people say we choose different cohort or wrong cohort, like ethnicity we know is important now. And people, when they sell the cohort, normally, or for some reason, practical reason, maybe they cannot do it, the age is important, the lifestyle and so forth. So that could be a problem with experiment design, and we cannot do anything on that. Although people now try to improve that experiment design, but could be also a problem of how we analyze the data. Okay, so uh, that's what we tackled. So what we did, okay, and go over and over here. Okay, but the other thing is there are a few cases of GY study, like the multiple sclerosis, where this study, they found a correlation between the, uh, uh, the location of these people uh, with multiple sclerosis because they find a mutation in the vitamin D pathways. Uh, that's, of course, that can correlate with the sun, right? It depends where you live. And also uh, for this uh, syndrome where uh, there was a mutation in uh, the TNF uh, pathway and you know now you can give some injection of tnf and the patient work well so our idea is again the gys is correlation so it's like if you remember the beginning of the network the gy study is you have a list of con uh, sorry a list of mutation but we don't try to connect them together so th our method is try to use a, v a, v a network based approach and try to generate a genetic interaction network and discover those SNPs that not always are present in the court or not, but tend to be more correlated in terms of uh, prediction of the link. Okay, so that is the idea. How we do it, so we done it, of course, with Yuma, sorry, repetition. Okay, so we decide to study inflammatory disease. Why? Because uh, are important because our collaborator give us very nice uh, GYS data set that are here from this National Human Genome Institute. And that's our, the classical GY study where uh, on a panel of different inflammatory diseases, there is a large cohort. So how we analyze this? So we forget about defining the GYs and correlate with the phenotype. What we did is create a bipartite network. Let's say you have the different uh, inflammatory disease. Here, similar to what the guy printed uh, before, I like try to find also SNPs that tend to correlate in different diseases that are common uh, phenotype. And that's are the gene we found to be mutated. And we transfer this bipartite network to a 2D network in this way. Let's say C, the gene C or the mutation C and E, they're always present in two diseases, B and D. So then we see these two genes, they need to be correlated in some way, and we weight the ages, too. If they were present in all the disease we test, there will be the number of the disease there. It's a simple way to weight the ages and tell you the most likely is real. So we generate the network, and that is how it looks like. Now each dot is a, a gene, a mutation, and the interaction meaning that they somehow interact together in one disease or more disease, in that panel of inflammatory disease. Once you do it, this type of network, right, 
you want to test if it's real. So therefore you want to test this is power law, local community, and so forth. And again, that is the local community paradigm. That is the power law, non-analog place. So imagine if you log log this, it's going down like that. See, that's a, a list is network with unbiased, unbiasedly generated tend to have property or real world network. So then we cluster with the modularity optimization algorithm. We clustered this network. And what we found that's here, we clustered the network, and what we surprisingly found is a lot of these genes, they interact together, they cluster based on the disease type and ear color. That's our role, the panel of the disease. Then we want to validate this. So uh, how we validate, we see if for each of these cluster or local community that's correlated with the disease, the gene that we define to be interacting uh, genetically, uh, sorry, yeah, genetically, they are co-expressed in the tissue and the answer is surprisingly is not but if they tend to be involved in similar pathways or gene ontology or pathways so the fact that we don't find a lot of correlation with co-expression let's say of this cluster uh, or the gene in this cluster is because these are complex diseases maybe these gene are yet working in the same pathway or do similar function or maybe different cell or in different time of the cell okay uh, that is our idea why the correlation or co-expression didn't work that well. So, and again, we run our predictor like before, okay? And here is some example that we validate with collaborator. Oh, okay, let me s explain here. These are interaction that they never have shown before for two different diseases, cardiac, uh, cellular disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and um, HIV, hypothyroidism and psoriasis. So these interactions are predicted by our method and ranked among the top one. And then we ask uh, people know better than us about disease. You know, if there is why it is we predict it to be very strongly correlated and they have a genetic interaction. And actually, for example, this three gene here, or all these, no, sorry, there are five genes, but this interaction, so our collaborator tested and seemed to be very important for TAH, no, T cell proliferation. And that's our and also he told us that, uh, you know, in this type of disease, sometimes you see a, a hyperproliferation of T-cell. Don't ask me this biological question, I don't know that much. So another set of interaction we predict, uh, including four nodes, and these are all proteins that are involved in calcium metabolism, you know, that uh, controlling the calcium level inside the cell, and that could explain because uh, all this... Uh, skin disease and HIV that's also happening in HIV, so you have skin problem because again, the medical doctor told me that all these disease, they have this skin problem because could be a problem of calcium transport, okay? Again, don't ask me questions, that's what my collaborator told me. And they validate the expression in that system. So the last thing, five minutes, so using the same method, now what we did is we ask genetic and the type of GWAS study, uh, so we say, okay, our method is work better than the PCA, that is a linear dimensional reduction, when MC is also non-linear. So uh, what we did is, one thing that I also think that very important to design GWAS study or analyzing GWAS study is first to understand the population structure of the the cohort, the population structure meaning, if you look in Europe, uh, you take a random sample of sequence the genome, you see how that they fit in, in different type of structure uh, based on where they're coming from, the ethnicity. That is very important. And I think this is not only my idea, other colleagues that they do in genetic studies. So, and that's people start to do it. I know in Asia there is the Padgett Consortium and so forth. So again, because we want to analyze this, so we reanalyze a panel of uh, population structure data. That's a human genome from Europe uh, using uh, the non-center MC comparing with the PCA, that is the classical technique that all these guys uh, do in population genomic use. Well, in this plot, what we can see here, that's the PCA MC, they work very well. Each of these is an individual and each of the color is a different population. Here we have the African, the Central European, the Chinese, I think, and the Japanese. Again, we separate very well, but not really, see here, the Japanese and the Chinese, the PCA doesn't separate them well, but the MC here, see, I mean, the color, they don't help. In order, and also in order, the population based on the phylogenetic tree generated. Here, the Malaysian, for instance, different ethnicity. Again, there is complementarity between linear model and nonlinear model, 
but oh, so we found uh, something very interesting. So that is a subpopulation we cannot distinguish. Okay, we didn't know that was uh, really done blindly. So that is how each of the individuals been divided by the PCA, and that is how each individual is divided or partitioned by our method. So when we look what's going on, we find out that tests are both Japanese, but this one from Tokyo, and this one from Okinawa. Okinawa is a small island in the Pacific, so they're Japanese, but they look also different, okay? That was interesting because that's now we show that our method show that you know, it's complementary with the PCA, but also can define uh, some hidden part that uh, that's the PCA failed to uh, decide. But even more, now if we pull out the SNP, okay, that we use or our method def used to uh, the best SNP to define this two population, and we train the PCA with the SNP. So okay, this is the PCA. Forget about every other SNPs. Just look at this SNP and try to divide this two population nicely divided. So our method also can uh, use it as a way to prioritize SNPs in order to divide population of disease. You can say that this one now are not two different populations from Japan and Okinawa. Could be two different diseases or like disease and non-disease. And even more interesting, when that is actually the SNPs, we found some cluster that's our method used to separate the two population, then we ask, what are these genes, right? Why there is a, a high incidence of SNPs in the Okinawan if compared with the Japanese? And where are these SNP? Of course, we cannot map all the, uh, the gene, uh, sorry, the SNP to a gene, but we, we managed to map some of them. And what we found, so you know, Okinawa, they tend to live very long. It's a place in the world where there is m uh, people, uh, uh, you know, more people over 100 years. For some reason, the people go there and study why, right? And there is no other place. So uh, uh, that is the Okinawa Centenary Study. So uh, because Okinawan elders experience lower age decline and avoid disease of aging. It's true. Uh, so what we found that some of the gene, okay, uh, that we identify in this IMAP and that are separating better the Okinawa with the Tokyan are genes that, for example, uh, member, a lot of them are member of TGF beta pathway. Okay? And then we look in literature and we find a recent paper where these people in mice they study the effect of TGF on uh, reversing the aging of the mice. They did this long time experiment, they injected. TGF beta, and then they studied uh, the aging of the mice at a different level. It was a cell paper or something. And they found out that TGF have ability to slow down, at least in mice, I think. So, and could be a, uh, a coincidence. We don't know yet to, to do further study, but a lot of these genes that we identify to separate, the, I mean, we identify SNPs that separate uh, the Okinawa from the Japanese. Uh, from the Tokians, so tend to be involved in TGF beta pathway. Okay, so again, a prediction, but now you can start to, if you're interested in this aging uh, process, you can start to look uh, uh, closely at this gene and see if there is correlation with also aging disease or other stuff. So, right, we stop here in this kind of prediction. So, I think that I'm done. That, that was the last one.